Hello, everyone. It is now spring of 2023, which means we are in the midst of celebrating the 20th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project, a major milestone in the history of science. The story of the 13-year Human Genome Project was one of great accomplishments and in many ways, incredible audacity. In reality, the Human Genome Project consisted of many smaller narratives, some scientific, some political, and some sociological. Some of these narratives have never been told, or at least not told in much detail. Now, one such narrative involved the efforts of five genome sequencing centers who worked closely together in the Human Genome Project's final stages, a group known as the G5, a name affectionately used to mirror well-known groupings of countries, such as the G7 political group. I'm not gonna go through the of course, there were some who might have falsely thought the G part of the name stood for genomics, but it didn't. In this video conversation, we aim to highlight and even uncover new insights to the story of the G5. For the first time in many years, and in honor of the 20th anniversary, we at the National Human Genome Research Institute have gathered together, virtually of course, the G5 for a reunion. To toast the 20 years of great science since and to share stories that couldn't have been told back then, we are here today to hear from those who participated in the G5. And before I introduce my guests, let me provide a little bit more context to this. As the Human Genome Project pursued its last and most difficult goal, that is generating the first sequence of the human genome, there were groups around the world contributing to that effort. In fact, by the end of the Human Genome Project, something like 20 different countries contributed to the generation of that first human genome sequence. To effectively get the job done on time, it was decided that a small group of people from the largest genome sequencing centers would need to take the lead to make sure the goal of sequencing the human genome was completed in an organized and a coherent fashion. And at the end of the day, five such centers producing the largest amount of sequence data came together, hence the G5. The G5 worked very closely together in the final stage of the Human Genome Project to generate most of the human genome sequence to ensure that the human genome sequence produced was high quality and to organize the worldwide effort. And of course, the importance of this achievement cannot be emphasized enough. The first human genome sequence was the signature accomplishment of the Human Genome Project with its successful generation representing the project's finish line. With that background, let me introduce my friends and colleagues representing different parts of the G5 who have joined me for today's discussion. So first, Jane Rogers, then at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, previously known as the Sanger Center in Hingston, UK, along with Michael Morgan, then a leader at the Wellcome Trust. Second, Ari Petrinos, representing the efforts of the Department of Energy's Joint Genome Institute in Walnut Creek, California, in the United States. Third, Eric Lander of the Broad Institute, Whitehead Institute of Biomedical Research at MIT in Cambridge, in the United States. Fourth, Richard Gibbs, Baylor College of Medicine's Human Genome Sequencing Center in Houston in the United States. And then fifth, Bob Waterston, then at Washington University School of Medicine's Genome Sequencing Center in St. Louis in the United States. And of course, any outstanding group needed a leader to drive them to success. And that key leadership was provided by Francis Collins, then the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, or NHGRI, at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Well, welcome to each and every one of you, and thanks for joining me virtually today. And let me just immediately say, we all look just as youthful as what we looked like on the final day of the project 20 years ago. So with that incredible stretch of the truth, let's pull back the curtain and discuss the true unfettered and untold story of the G5. Now, memories are, of course, not always complete, and they can morph as the years have passed, but that's why I think it's wonderful to have all of you, because the group as a whole will provide a check and balance to the facts. I will welcome anyone to speak up when your memory is different than any other person. And I will be the moderator and the host for this conversation, and I have my cup of tea here, and I am ready to go. So, to start, 
let's discuss how the G5 came to exist and why its creation was so important. So thinking about that, tell me, what was your memory? You know, our history archive that we keep here at NHGRI shows that February of 1999 was the starting point for the G5 group. Does this ring true in other people's memories? Mm. No. no. That sounds know. really late. So we believe that it was uh, around February of 1999. If, if that's not the case, no, does... I, I don't think that's the case, Eric. Okay. Um, I think... The first time we got together was in December of the, of the, the preceding December. Hmm. And that was an important meeting. John had sent off his infamous friendly fire note about a month before that. And I think it was that the realization that people were going in different directions that led to us getting together. John was summoned, as he put it, uh, to appear before the NHGRI Advisory Council. So he was coming to Washington. And I think there was a meeting of the five of us, or the five centers, uh, that was associated with that. And Bob, do you think that Solston Salvo was the trigger that led to the creation of the G5, or was it just the, the facts, the way they were coming together at the time, that was the trigger to create the G5? I mean, the, the G5 was really created by funding decisions, right? I mean, in essence, the, the fact that the three US centers represented here got the bulk of the NHGR funds, uh, and the Sanger Center had uh, its commitment from the Wellcome Trust, and the the DOE had committed, and and so it was clear that those five groups had the bulk of the the resources. So I think that's how it settled on five. Uh, but Francis can or somebody else can chime in think, on that. I think Bob's memory is better than mine in this circumstance. <clears throat> but I certainly do have a clear memory of the friendly fire message, which got quite a <laughs> bit of attention uh, well beyond our community of genome sequencers um, and certainly did point to the need of having a more coherent plan amongst the major producers of yeah. sequences. Just a little background here, Eric, because people jumping in on this may wonder, well, what was going on before that? We had quite a gaggle of genome sequencing centers involved uh, starting back in about 1996 when it became clear that you could actually start working on the human genome. We were all encouraged by the successes that were happening with model organisms, particularly what Bob and John had done with C. elegans. But it was kind of a gaggle. And as you might expect, some of those centers uh, had grand ideas, but didn't really kind of live up to those. Before the G5 really fell together, we had 20 genome centers that were contributing in some way, and that was impossible to manage and to hold everybody accountable. So the notion that we had to kind of get serious uh, and take the five centers that really had the capacity and turn this into a production-minded effort, it was time. And I guess even though that, <laughs> that letter from John was sort of painful, especially to me, it got us in a, uh, in a good direction. Uh, Francis, uh, can I was... chip in here yeah. and, and say um, the stimulus to get to really get going and concentrate was I mean, really provided by Solera, by their yeah. announcement that they were going to work on the Human Genome Project. At the Sanger, we'd already been in to ask for increased funding from the Wellcome Trust. It was actually prior to that because of ha having met at one of the, the, it was the third Bermuda meeting, Mm -hmm. At that point, our perception was that people really weren't focused. They were at sea, and we needed to up our ante to from a sixth of the genome to a third of the genome to get people to take notice and start to chip in if they wanted to join in at all. So, um, you know, that, that that I think you know at that point things started getting getting moving. But Solera's announcement that they were going to do the human. I think that was the catalyst to, to, you know, get us thinking about how we would go about doing the sequencing. And there was a meeting at Early House not long after the Cold Spring Harbour meeting that I think focused on 
what could be done, how should it be done, and what should the product be? My memory is that the crucial thing that really was catalytic was, in fact, the formation of Solera in the Cold Spring Harbour meeting that I attended with John Solston, at which we announced that we were going to sequence, pay for the sequencing, the Wellcome Trust, of the whole genome, even if the American partners left. In my mind, that was the thing that really focused minds, and we then had to be properly organised to get the job done. And that's when it moved from individual labs doing their thing to really a coordinated <laughs> industrial activity. That's my memory. So Richard and Eric, I, I saw your hands go up at different times. Do you still have comments? I'll, I'll just add one thing that you may or not recollect. And I think between that uh, May meeting in 1998 and the Solera announcement and all of those events that happened before the March 1999 gathering in Houston, uh, I think that's what we could have a lot of conversation about. But at the meeting in Houston, we weren't funded yet. That's, you know, I think the process of refunding was happening, but there were no official announcements, so we could not declare ourselves the anointed group to be supported to finish the job. But nevertheless, we came together to discuss the principles, and that was the tenor of that meeting. So I, to me, why that meeting, or even one after it, was sort of the first official G5. But no doubt we all coalesced after our fun meeting in May of 1998. Oh. Eric, you want to add to that? Sure. I, I think trying to figure out when the G5 started is hard because the G5 means many different things. Um, I would date the G5 to several years earlier in the sense that it was becoming apparent that there were five centers that were prepared to take serious responsibility and who intellectually respected each other. Not to say we didn't fight with each other and all that, but there was a lot of intellectual respect and responsibility. And I think Francis's point about, you know, the original Bermuda meetings, when people showed up from all over the world and made land grabs for, I'm going to take this part of the genome and I'm going to take that part of the genome without necessarily being able to back it up with, with the confidence that they deliver represents the tension between a project that at its core is trying to be inclusive of everybody in the world and at the same time has to get a concrete job done. And so I would say there was an evolution from early Bermuda into a little later and then kicked into gear of we must actually put ourselves on a deeply organized footing as time went on and particularly with the Solera announcement but I would say that G5 was not created in a big bang, but coalesced out of out of the inchoate original genome. And it has lessons for, for how such projects should be organized. Because had, had that had been designated at the beginning of who was the G5, it wouldn't have been as good as if it had evolved in the way that it did. All right, and we're going to get into that in a couple of minutes. Actually, I want to ask uh, two more questions before we move on. One is just a simple question, although I'm not sure we'll remember. Who named the G5? It coalesced. I remember that. But at some point, that became a word. I mean, that became a phraseology. Eric, you remember? Yeah, I at least, of course, the, we can all compare memories. But I like giving things cute names. And, and so I remember having said, this was, you know, like the G7. Now, somebody else may have said that, too. But my recollection was it was one of these cute names that we we tossed out in passing as a semi-joke and it's stuck. My recollection is we started off with the G15. It was inclusive. Mm -hmm. And we then had the G5. I think, I think Francis made this comment. The G5 was the Security Council. I think I did. And I think it was the G20 was the overall group. But I don't think we named the 20 until the we other already way. named the five. <laughs> yeah, we had the five. And then what are we going to call the rest of them? OK, they must be the G20. <laughs> that was my recollection. And that actually leads me to my last question in this in this category. I mean, I'm going to direct this either at Michael or Jane because there was there were G5 had four U.S. components and one non-U.S. component. Michael and or Jane did, did was that sort of difficult um, in terms of was there adequate international representation? Did you feel it was too U.S. centric? It ended up that way with the collection of five, but 
what were your memories then or now in terms of making sure there was that right balance internationally? I think some of John's um, excitedness came from uh, feeling at times that if we hadn't been as big as we had been, you know, whether we would actually be a part of it at all. Um, but we were very conscious, I think, on our side of the Atlantic, of the need to represent the centres who were left out of the G5 when, when that formed. Um, there were centres who had been working really quite hard to try and get, you know, the funding needed. Jean Weissenbach in, in Paris for, for one, Sakaki in, in Japan. And I, I, was, I was very conscious that what we shouldn't be doing is doing something that would exclude them in a way that was detrimental to the project. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Or uh, maybe Michael first and then Ari. I think you have to include in this the meetings that we had we went around the countries. So we went to China, we went to Japan. And so there was always this bigger group that were kept informed. That's why I've used that term of the Security Council as part of the, the United Nations. Ari? Uh, I remember I think very we went well, to... and I have the notes to back it up about how aggressively I fought to make sure Huan Min Young and the BGI that was there at the early stages played a role. Of course, they, they did sequence a few things, but it was pretty trivial, but it was important that a country like China be represented uh, significantly at the, at the table here. Indeed. I also worked pretty hard to try to be inclusive of Juan Ming Young and his team, uh, which started from a very uh, relatively rudimentary state and scaled themselves up very quickly. And look what's happened. <laughs> China has become so remarkable mm -hmm. in genomics from that early start. I still, I mean, you know, even in this current today's climate, I'm very, very close and working closely with uh, Juan Ming Young. So but, for the record, it's it's Juan Yang Ming, but <laughs> anyway, I, I just wanted to, to echo what Jane said. I mean, I had lots of conversations with John where he was very worried about the U.S. centric uh, nature of things and whether the the U.S. was just going going along on its own and making sure that Jean Weissenbach, Andre Rosenthal, and so forth were included where we could. Richard, you were gonna make a comment? Oh yeah, um, you know, I, I wrote a small piece a couple of years ago about the project, as many of us have, and I kind of rushed it out. And I think I've got one thing right and one thing very wrong. The right thing is that I called it, the human genome project changed everything. And I'm kind of proud of that sentence. But what I got really wrong was not emphasizing the community and mm. just how strong it, what everybody's talking about um, how, how much that contributed to the way that I think we all think about science. And yeah. like some of you, I'm still close with Henry. Um, and uh, it would, but for that, 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 you know, that, that connection would not be there. And I wonder what we can do to, if we rekindle anything, it would be that sense of international community. I agree. So a couple of you mentioned in describing how the G5 formed the importance of getting it right in executing a big science project like the Human Genome Project. And, and a couple of you alluded to the fact that we really did learn some lessons about how to do this right. And so I, I think it's worth discussing a little bit about how the G5 actually interacted, uh, because I think it, it helps illustrate what might be necessary in other big science projects that have taken place since then or might take place in the, in the, in the future. And, you know, how do you even coordinate all of this when there's so many people involved? So my understanding, and I never participated in a, in a G5 call. I was in a different stage of my responsibilities at NHGRI, but I heard a lot about it. And I uh, then, and I heard a lot about it recently, is that, is that um, you would mostly meet by conference call. A couple times a year, you would try to have face-to-faces. Um, that it was decided that the, the every conference call would take place or the great majority of them would be routine to have it on Friday 
at 11 o'clock Eastern time, which ironically is exactly the time we scheduled this call, and in part to deal with different time zones and the various participants. And that was very regimented. So I'm seeing heads nodding, so I think I got those facts right. I guess what one of the questions I have is, you know, who decided and how was it decided who could join these G5 calls? What were the rules for having additional people join either at the designated sites or guests? Or were there always other people? I know that some databases were invited to join at least some of the calls. How were those sorts of decisions made and coordinated? So I'll jump in. Um, and much credit here uh, to Mark Geyer, Jane Peterson, Chris Wetterstrand, who were part of the team to put those calls together every Friday. And yeah, I still have an anxiety attack occasionally on Friday at 11 o'clock. But oh my God, are we ready for the G5 meeting? Is the agenda ready to go? One of the things we tried to do was to make it scientifically interesting. So there was, at least for some of the meetings, the first half was a lab meeting where one of the G5 would have something they wanted to talk about, maybe a new sequencing technology or a new assembly or some new insight about the genome. And then we'd get into the really nitty gritty. And a lot of what had to happen was to develop these tools that allowed us to assess production on a day by day or at least week by week basis. And those were not trivial to put together, but then that became understandably a big focus. Are we on track? Can we project where we're going to need to get to in order to meet the goals, especially with the Solera threat? And uh, what do we need to do if one center is maybe a little ahead of where they thought they would be and somebody else is a little bit behind. Could we do some shifting of territory uh, to try to make sure we get the whole genome done at the same time and not with some places that were still falling behind? All of that had to kind of fit together. So I think Mark and Jane and Chris and I um, would often be the ones to try to figure out what the agenda was going to be. But it was very much a group kind of decision about what are the most important things. And we would often end, I think, each talk with a uh, each meeting with a sense of what should we talk about next week that needs particular attention right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it was super intense. It was super collegial. There were times where there were some butting of heads because there are no small egos, including me and in, in the G5 uh, community. But I don't think there was ever a sense uh, that we were anything other than completely united uh, to achieve the goal. And Francis, did you moderate this? Like, you know, you were the one that cut people off and it was always an hour. I mean, was all this pretty tightly controlled? Pretty tight because people had lots of other things they were doing. And yeah, I guess that was my job and I'm not sure whether I was very good at it. Yeah. So I'd like to hear from some others who, you know, were, were, was it good the way these agendas got formed, how these meetings got run? I want to know when we actually started calling. So I have the memory of the the December meeting and Richard's right, another big step. Mm -hmm. When did we start actually having weekly calls? Mm. Well, it was pretty I soon think it, the face to face, right? I assume it was shortly after Houston. It was it must have been when the funding was announced or something like that, when when our self-designation as the G5 became more legitimate. Jane, was that your memory? Yeah, no, I, I had a feeling that we were uh, the, the calls came later, that they they didn't really start until autumn of 1999. I think we really got going when, when Solera announced that they'd sequenced the fly and were turning their attention to the human. Because at that point, we really had to accelerate. And that, I think, was a real stimulus to go to, these week, to the weekly calls. Before that, you know, we had face-to-face -face meetings Think, what would they be? Were they quarterly? This is, uh, I, we think face to face were roughly twice a year. That's what our records show. Sometimes they were three or four times. But I thought they were like a, every more often than twice a year. But is that the case indeed? But I, I really am curious when the when the calls started on a regular basis. I just I don't have a clear recognition rec recollection of that. Eric Green, I thought you said you had minutes of the first call and you were saying it was something like March of 1999. Did I make that up? We don't know. We're scouring our database. We're literally looking at our archives now. Well, there was a difference between where we have evidence where the G5 being referred to as opposed to call minutes. So that was the distinction. We have records of the word being used, but not necessarily a call minutes. I have a little different recollection of the calls than Francis did. I think they were, <laughs> we were clearly united in having the goal, but 
I think the the meetings were often very contentious. Uh Uh, And there was a lot of back and forth between the groups about who was doing what and why we were doing it. And they were vigorous discussions. I'll accept your amendment. They were in. I'm I'm in with with Bob on this. And that's what made them so good. I mean, you know, Francis, you said there were strong egos. I think, you know, true. But I think the important thing was there were strong views on what was important, how to do things. And and those arguments, in which were you know strong and sometimes heated, were were about principles and different approaches and things. And I think because it was a collection of five super smart centers that that had opinions about the ways to do things, you know, I think this was the whole strength of the human of the public human genome project was it was not a monolithic point of view, and. By the time we were done with a couple of weeks talking about something, we had moved each other, you know, somewhat. We had said th- these kind of data are needed. And that's frankly why I love the G5, because you always got off, you got off the phone exasperated sometimes, but you always got off better, for, you know, from having having hashed stuff out, even if you didn't necessarily want to admit it every week. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say that's a, that's in high. Insight, I can ha- I can accept that. <laughs> yeah, in hindsight, in hindsight. <laughs> but Michael, you had a you had a comment. Michael, you had a comment. Yeah, um, I have a slightly different take on this because the British effort was in no way competitive with any other British effort. It was the British effort, and there was only one source of funding. There was no competition for funds. Right. My recollection is that there was a lot of competition amongst the US big labs for funding and for the rest of it. So I think the British end of it was in a slightly different position, very privileged, really. They just had a tap at the Wellcome Trust, and it was basically on most of the time. (laughs) I agree with Michael. (laughs) I didn't feel like that. (laughs) (laughs) You weren't supposed to feel like that. (laughs) What were you going to say? Well, uh, you know, I... I guess I weigh in a little bit with um, Bob and Eric. I think we had some spirited conversations. <laughs> I want to say that I learned a lot of the, from the process in, in how the rest of my career and working life has unfolded. It's okay to have ferocious discussions if you've got strong leadership and a willingness to execute or make a decision and have everybody execute on it. And that's what we had, I think. We had a leadership that and a structure that allowed, we knew no matter how much we argued, that sooner or later, someone, there would be a process, things would get decided one way or the other for the argument. I think the other thing is, you know, we looked at graphs of progress, real data. So, you know, it's a lot of our, the arenas we work in now um, are not anchored to real data and the discussions are all over the place. But, you know, the genome veterans look at these kind of meetings and other gatherings and say, well, if we had a graph about what's actually been done, the discussion would be different. We learned that from the G5. So, so Francis, you know, I, I, I want to endorse what Richard just said there and go back to the first quality assessments when mm-hmm. genome centers had to sequence stuff and send them around. I think the Genome Project um, really promoted a transparency, which was deeply uncomfortable. I hated opening that brown envelope when the quality assessments came back and you saw, you know, what your quality had been judged to be, but it was the heart of what made this project get better and better. And then as Richard says, with the graphs going up, real efforts at transparency. So I I don't want to lose that as one of the the key features of the project overall and the G5 in particular. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I was going to also. It wasn't just about how many base pairs are people claiming they have sequenced, but are they reliable? <laughs> and that was quite a complicated process to set that up uh, in terms of this sort of round robin for doing quality assessment. But it was critical. And we learned some stuff about the way in which we were approaching this. If we had not done that, uh, we might be still reeling from people complaining that what we produced was not a quality product. And it was actually much better than most people thought it could be. That's Absolutely correct. I, I mean, we learned a lot from from those things. Uh, and in terms of transparency, it made us, you know, when we said things, we knew we had to be able to back them up. We did have a lot of different views about how things were done. We did come together 
And I think the reason we came together was that we really did have this overarching goal that we all very strongly shared, that we had to get this sequence there and we had to do it at the same time as Solera so that the data would be out there for everyone to use. It was not just getting the genome done, it was getting the genome out there for everybody to use for free. Yeah, and we're gonna come to that. We will actually come a little bit more to Solera in a little bit. Michael, you wanna say something before I ask another question? I just, I, I just wanna make certain it's not misunderstood that um, Sanger was on its own. Sanger benefited enormously from being part of the whole enterprise, the learning aspects and all the rest of it. So if I gave that impression, it's not one that I really want to leave right. on the table. Right, no. So. Yeah, sort of back you up on that, Michael, because we did learn a lot. Yes, it, as Eric and, and Richard have already said, it was very painful sitting in those Friday meetings, especially when, you know, people were haranguing us for not doing as well as we were expected, like we were expecting to. We, we had problems galore. Um and, and on the finishing side, I can remember, I still remember Eric, you know, having more than one go at me for keeping our finishing going when, you know, the emphasis should have been on getting the, the shot gun through. But um, so you, you'll live in my memory forever for that, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for the record, for the record, she was referring to Eric Lander and not yes. Eric Green. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. uh, just, just one other point on all this, I think, as, as Michael pointed out, you know, there was a funding competition issue that drove some of the um, behavioural patterns that you saw. But for a lot, a lot of the period, Michael, funding was stable. So it was all the other things, the egos and the scientific genuine, you know, genuine disagreements that drove the vociferous nature of the yeah. discussion. And I, I think to Richard's point, there was no way any one centre could succeed over the other centres. We had one goal, which mm -hmm. if we failed to deliver, we were just going to all fail. Mm -hmm. And if we delivered, it was going to take all of us. So as much as I remember, we had our, our friendly competitions or something like that. The major thing was we had a job that we, we had to get done and we can only do it together. I and think so, you made a new word, Eric. I remember uh, cooperation. <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, we we did just jump into our, our history database, and we now have more evidence to suggest that the first conference call of the G5 was February of 1999. Wow. Oh, that early. So, so February of 1999. Yeah. All right, I'm going to ask one more question in this, er this, this area, and then we're going to move on. But um, I can't help but ask it partially because I'm a technology geek. You all dealt, you all interacted the most by conference calls, staring at polycoms probably. And you know, the world's in a different place now with, with virtual connections that include video like we're doing now. I'm just curious if any of you have done the thought experiment, what might the G5 have been like if there would have been video capabilities or this kind of an interaction instead of polycom? Would it have all been the same, didn't matter? Or, or it would have been a little different? Less facial expressions and rude gestures, I think. <laughs> exactly. The conference well, call meant we could throw up our hands and screw yes. up our faces. And hit the mute button and say something. You could, the, you could hit the mute button and talk to everybody around the table and say whatever you wanted. Right. <laughs> okay, so therapeutically so, valuable. Okay, all right. So I, what I'm hearing is that Zoom would have made everybody behave better, but therapeutically it wouldn't have been as good, that you needed to that mute button to blow off steam. Anybody have anything to add to that before we move on? Zoom call has a mute button too, but you can see people's mouth moving unless you're gonna turn off the video too. It's a little Some more people rude, are pretty right? good at reading lips and that might ruin the community sense of uh, working together. <laughs> and, but I will point out, I mean, we all laugh about that, but you know, NHGRI now has major consortia we're running and the way the, the, the groups are interacting is by Zoom. So it's not by, by conference call. And so there is a new dynamic with these kinds of efforts that you, your behavior has to be a little bit different because you can be seen. Yeah, and, looking at my screen, looking you can, at my screen, Eric, I see eight pictures. What if it were 25? Would that make it easier or worse? Oh, worse. <laughs> <laughs> Would make it worse for me because I can keep track of at least a handful of you. Twenty would be hard to keep track of, and and you can hit the mute button and nobody knows that you've hit it. Ah, that's right. 
That's right. So again, you could be you could misbehave more when it's just the phone. That's what we keep hearing. And you're on better behavior when it's by Zoom. So let me transition because this sort of I immediately started hearing about personality traits coming out from these G5 interactions. You know, and as, as time goes on, the personal side and the personal anecdotes sometimes are the hardest ones to recover. I mean, we look in our digital archives and we learn a lot about the facts of what happened, what got discussed, what was concluded. But you don't really get a very good sense of sociology necessarily, or you have to read between the lines. So I could imagine that, and it's true of you know any group that is dealing with high-powered issues, that people take on different personas. I'll give you examples. Some people are optimists and cheerleaders. Some people are pessimists and Debbie Downers. Some people just like to kvetch all the time and complain. Some people like to be very funny. They're the jokesters, the comedians. Some people can be little rascals and be really bratty. I'd be curious to hear in like one word or one phrase how each of you believe you are characterized or how did you behave on those calls? So Richard, I'm gonna start with you. How do you think you were, what was your persona during most of those interactions? I find that almost impossible to answer. Um, but I can tell you that um, one person at one moment told me I was the nice guy in the genome project and another person within an hour in my local environment told me what an a-hole I was. <laughs> <laughs> I think okay. I'll leave it with that. Bob, what do you think your persona was? Oh, I'd like to think that I was the reasonable one in the room. Okay. Jane, what about you? I felt that I was you know, sort of the face of, of the people who were actually doing the work at the Sanger. I'm a listener, so I did a lot of listening. John and I used to take these calls together on a Friday afternoon for us. And, you know, when it got particularly fractious is not the right word, but stimulating, I suppose, we always had to go to the red line on the way home. And, and the time <laughs> that we spent there was proportionate to the, the air at that time on the call, I think, or the, the heatedness of the call. So no, I, th I think I was a sort of, I, I was a listener and, and, you know, sort of a very reasonable person on those calls. I'll let you say, and then I, I'll be curious if Bob or others have a thought. What, what was John Salston's persona? Excitable when there was an issue to discuss. So he was excitable. Bob, do you agree with that? Yeah, he certainly, he, he had his buttons. Yeah. <laughs> Eric Lander. How are you? How do, what do you think your persona was? Well, I'm I'm going to go with excitable and stubborn, which I would agree that John also was excitable and stubborn. And I had like so much respect for John because we didn't always agree on things, but I, I just always respected. And Bob was the reasonable one. Yeah, you know, Richard might have been the nice one, but Bob was always the reasonable one because he would come in with the with the calm voice and then bring us back to, you know, we're all in this together and 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 jane was was always like incredibly sensible um in these things no but i mean they, they, these calls got to to sometimes be very excitable and i think of you as being grounded and, ex and sensible in, in a lot of this and i think all this dynamic was like really critical you couldn't just be complacent about your thinking because yeah you had to deal with your g5 colleagues I think hearing about all this excitability and so forth, I think I'm right, Francis, that at one point the calls had gotten so fractious that you called me up and said, what can we do to solve this problem? Because we were, we were spending more time at each other's throats and not resolving things. And I think that's when we started rotating the leadership of the calls, or I mean, you were still the moderator or whatever, but then one group was in charge each week. Yeah, Bob, you're exactly right. And I hadn't had a clear memory of it until you brought it back to mind. Uh, and yeah, that was what we tried to do. And since you were the reasonable one, I guess you're the one I called and said, how do we make this whole thing more reasonable? And, and yes, we did then start at least the rotation where each group would take a turn in the lab meeting part of it. 
and and say what they thought the group would learn from and get us back into getting excited about the science instead of arguing about this curve or that curve or whether we were doing too much shotgun or not enough clone by clone, which tended to be the place where usually things got heated. But yeah, you're right. That was there. There were times where it got uh, pretty tense. There were well more than one of the people I see on this uh, screen. I had to call and say, you know, what you said to your colleague that really wasn't very friendly. Uh, so yeah, uh, a, a little bit of visits to the woodshed occasionally were needed, but not very often. Ari, what about you? What was your persona? Uh, I was pretty stressed out because of some of the internal DOE problems that were very unique to me that you had absolutely no idea. Uh, I was under the pressure for. So uh, that was what I remember the most, um, the internal problems that I was facing that were understandable and, in fact, perhaps even more difficult than what I had expected. So that's my persona. Okay. And Michael, were you on many of these calls and participating? What was your persona? I think everybody would agree I was Mr. Nice. Okay. <laughs> you still are. <laughs> All right. Well, that then leaves just Francis. Francis, what was your persona? Um, I hope I wasn't excitable, but I was excited about the science. And I think mostly I was an optimistic peacemaker. You were frustrated about progress. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that came through. <laughs> <laughs> I did now. Well, yeah, because we were all on the line, of course. <laughs> this was not a place where failure was an option. I remember going to Richard uh, to, to that meeting that you held in Houston, and I brought with me an entirely new proposal about how the G5 should get the job done, which I hadn't even discussed with my staff. I sort of had worked on it in my own head over a couple of days. And the room blew up and people were not sympathetic <laughs> with this approach, which was very much along the lines uh, of doing more hybrid and less clone by clone. Um, eventually, we figured out what to do. It, it, that was a feisty part of the discussion, Francis. I remember your opening speech, though which was Churchillian quote. <laughs> you want to recall it for us? Um, I, yeah, Churchillian would be very kind, but it was one of those, like, we are at the moment here. This is the precipice uh, that we might either succeed or fail, and we have got to reorganize our approach because if we continue on the current path, just mark it out here over the next few years, uh, we are not going to achieve uh, what we have promised to do. I, so, I, I remember when you're going through hell, keep on going. <laughs> I still use that sometimes. <laughs> but Francis, because because this is archival here, when you say if we keep doing what we were going to do, we would not have achieved what we wanted to achieve. Hmm. What exactly do you mean? We would have achieved the finished sequence. So, you know, I, I think we set the right goal and we stuck to the right goal that we were going to finish the sequence. And a lot of the arguments we had were about order and what we needed to have by a, a certain date and a draft and things. And I agree with you that that, that was, a, in the end, a critical decision on the one hand to say, because we had a competition, we had to have a draft product out there early. But on the other hand, everybody holding feet to the fire saying, and we must swear to each other in blood that we are not giving up on the goal and the timeline we had set. We're rearranging. And that was something where there was a lot of worry in the group, uh, particularly on the part of some, that we would we we would not actually hold ourselves accountable to finish it. And so I think we would have gotten the the thing done in the same time frame, but I think we would have lost in the in the court of public opinion had we not done it. And it was great to balance those. Things. Point very well taken. And I also get riled uh, when people say, well, it's only because uh, of Solera uh, that you guys actually finished the genome project in 2003. That's simply not true. But the trajectory we traveled was altered. Yes. By, by the way, before we move on, Ari, I can't help, but I feel like I was baited a little. You said there were some DOE issues that were making you nervous. Is there anything you can tell us that maybe you didn't want to talk about then, but you feel comfortable 20 years later? setting the record straight? Of course, you know, it may take a longer conversation, but in short, uh, my colleagues, competitors within the Office of Science of the Department of Energy couldn't wait to see the human genome end so that they can use the money that was funding it to, 
to fund some of these other much less important projects. <laughs> uh, that was a real problem that, um, mm -hmm. in fact, at the end contributed to my leaving the Department of Energy. I just wanted to follow up. When you say end, they didn't care how it ended. It's they just been done already. Right. <laughs> Is that right? They just wanted, they, they didn't worry about whether the project was actually finished or not. They just wanted your participation ended. Correct. Yeah. We're going to move on. And um, some of the discussion earlier about the creation of the G5 and some of the major values of the G5 were very much intertwined with the presence of Solera. And also this notion that we had to get the sequence done at least at the same time, and we had to get that sequence shared. And there was just so many aspects about Solera coming on the scene that, that were the antithesis of what those of us involved in the Human Genome Project thought was important and valued. And so very much that had a, we really need to make sure we talk about that more directly. So to stimulate that conversation, I can't help but I'm gonna just show a photograph. I took this photograph and I'm, I'm going to share it. And to me, to this day, when I looked at this photograph as recently as yesterday, I have an emotional wave that comes across because it, and the photo captures it in part because I was influenced by this because I was part of working with Bob Waterston and Rick Wilson and others at Wash U. And this is an example of a photo really telling a story. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. And interestingly, the camera I was using even put a, a, a timestamp on this. So this was, maybe many of you recognize, this was a photograph um, in the dining room of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories in May of 98 during the Cold Spring Harbor genome meeting. I think the timestamp, I would have guessed this was sometime in the middle of the night. The timestamp, I think it's 1 a.m. and it's just not a zero after the one. But I'm pretty sure this was probably 103 a.m., maybe a 38 seconds, something like that. And you could just read people's faces and body language. Um, you see on the right, Bob Waterston, whose just legs were incredibly muscular and handsome at the time. It was so clear he was in great running shape then. Sitting next to him was, uh, was John Sulston. And then you just go around the room. This is basically the Wash U contingent. Um, um, and um, you can see Rick Wilson, Stephanie Chizzo, Elaine Martis, Mark O'Mara, John McPherson. And I was there um, in part because I tended to hang with those folks, even though I was at NIH at the time, I was collaborating with the, my old friends at uh, Wash U, where I had come from. And boy, doesn't that picture just say a lot about, and, and I will just tell you that every one of the people, except for John and Bob, were fairly early in their career and felt that their, in some ways their career was being jeopardized because of the threat of what was happening because everything negative about the human genome project was coming to the fore. And we were all worried. Um, and, um, and I will tell you that Bob and John were cheerleaders. They, they really spent hours, I don't know how many hours we spoke there, and cheered us up and just said, this is not the end of where we're gonna figure this out. We got to rally, blah, 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 blah. So let me start by asking Bob, since you're the only other person in this picture, was that, you know, is, is that your memory? And what do you remember about that evening, that, that time, the, that discussion? Yeah, so this is probably the first night of the meeting, maybe the second night after Craig had shown up at the G whatever it was meeting that happened the two days before. Mm -hmm. uh, Craig showed up and and took Jerry Rubin aside and said he was going to do fly. And, you know, he, he presented his plans for the genome project uh, in front of everybody. Uh, we asked him lots of questions. It, he got prickly and so forth. And, you know, the announcement had been made the weekend before in the press, mm -hmm. um, all our all our people had heard about it. This was the first time that we really had a chance to sit down and talk through what we were, what our response should be, what was going to happen, and what we should do. Uh, and it was a it was a tough decision, tough discussion because even within our group, there were lots of different opinions about how we should react, whether we should bother at all. I mean, after all, it was just a press announcement. There was no 
There was nothing of reality. Craig hadn't done all that much as part of the of the G20. I mean, that's important to remember that he he was actually part of that group. And Eric is right that people sat around the table and decided who was doing what. And and Craig was sort of on the edge of all that. He wasn't he wasn't really producing a lot of sequence. And yet here there was this big announcement. Anyway, it was a tough discussion. And and you're right, we had to encourage people and bring them along. It was a long night. Bob, do you remember the, I think it could have been that night or it's the next night, but the Italian restaurant in Huntington, Long Island? Oh, yeah. 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 That was, you, and, you and me and Francis and Richard, were you there? And John. Yeah. And John. And we had John because this was, uh, I think, uh, really the G5 before the G5 in essence. And mm -hmm. there was this, uh, I forget what the name of the Italian restaurant is, but I'm never going to forget that dinner. We were taking different positions. John mm -hmm. was taking the position, just damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. We got to do what we're doing. It's not going to matter. Nobody's going to take it seriously. And because, you know, John can provoke me to take the opposite. I was I started rattling off notional headlines of what Craig and Solera were going to announce that when they'd done a certain number of reads that constituted one X coverage of the genome, they would announce that they had done 67 percent of the human genome because it's one minus E to the minus one. And then a little <laughs> later, they would announce they had done 90 some odd percent of it. And they wouldn't have assembled a damn thing, but the press releases, we could envisage what they were going to be. And you, of course, were reasonable in the middle. And we were just <laughs> trying to play. Well, I don't know. You were you were strong, but not compared to, to John and me. But, but we were trying to play out how it was already by within a day or two, we were playing out the... You know, to what extent are we are we sticking to our guns exactly? And to mm -hmm. what extent are we going to adjust to this? And what what was it going to look like publicly and and all? And it was very intense. So I wasn't at that thing in 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 the in Blackford, but but I remember how intense it was. And we all left exhausted from from that dinner. In terms of extremes, I think you're right. John was you know, we're going to finish this and we've got, we know how to do this. And we know that a shotgun is going to be very scattered and complete and mm -hmm. it'll all come out in the wash. And I think at one point you were actually advocating that we should do exactly what Craig was doing. We should be doing whole genome shotgun so that we can keep up. Otherwise we had no chance to, right. to win the headlines as you're putting it. And right. and we we explored by the end of that night all the models already that that we were eventually going to do was did we have to really probably, do the finishing on it or something? We, we explored a great deal of them, and I don't know if I was being reasonable, but I think John maybe because he he did have a a privileged English position was much less worried about the public opinion aspect of it, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and living in the U.S., you couldn't not be aware of that. And I, I, I'm just curious, at some point, Francis, maybe you can tell us some of the something about the pressures you were facing oh. on that front. Oh, they became intense. So yeah, I'll just uh, tell a quick story about how I learned about the announcement of what became called Solera was I get a note uh, saying Craig Venter would like to talk to you um, on a Friday night. Uh, and that's unusual. And uh, ultimately, we figured out I was on the way to Los Angeles for some weekend thing. And so we would meet uh, at Dallas Airport in one of those airport lounges. And I turn up and here is Craig, but here is Mike Hunkapiller. I don't think we all quite realized how far down the road uh, that relationship had been. And actually, Hunkapiller did more of the talking uh, than Craig did. And I began to realize this is probably a pretty serious endeavor. This is not smoke and mirrors, which I might have otherwise expected uh, from Craig. Subsequent to that, I got on my plane to go to Los Angeles. And who sat next to me for five hours? Mike Hunkapiller. <laughs> oh, my God. 
that, that was a nightmare. And pretty much the whole time uh, told me all the reasons why um, the sequencing capacity that they had developed at ABI was going to make Craig Venter's dreams come true and then some. So I became very seriously worried that this was potentially a real threat. So when we got to the Cold Spring Harbor meeting, first a G5 conversation where Craig talked and got, um, as you say, a little bit ruffled because we didn't all applaud. And then that meeting in the restaurant, which I do have an intense memory of and particularly came away from feeling very troubled because we didn't come up with a plan. I kind of thought maybe uh, in the space of a couple of hours over Italian food, we'll have a plan, but we didn't resolve it. Uh, we had these options. We could do this and they were pretty wide in, in their um, approaches uh, and they were not coalescing. And I really worried, my gosh, is this the moment uh, where our public project is going to stumble and we could not afford to? You ask about the pressures. Well, shortly after Nick Wade's Sunday morning, big front page New York Times piece, uh, Congress was immediately like, oh, uh, so what's going on here? And maybe maybe we don't need a public project anymore. This is a good thing. The private sector is going to take care of it. Uh, they generally missed the point about access to the data until it was hammered repeatedly <laughs> into the stories about this. And just after much back and forth, the person that we should always uh, recognize who we just lost the last uh, six months or so, John Porter, uh, the Republican chair of the House Appropriations Committee that oversaw NIH, became a total convert uh, to the importance of the public project, continuing and even expanding its work. And that's exactly the way it came forward. If it had not been for Porter, we could have been in a lot more trouble. So can I follow up on that? I mean, you say Congress, but was it did Porter call you up and say, well, what are you guys going to do? Or are, are you no, no longer necessary? It's I, no, it's I'm the usual dance. Some of that. The usual dance where I figure I got to go see Porter, who I had a pretty good relationship with. So you figure out how your staff talks to his staff and gets him to ask you to come and do a briefing because you're not allowed to just go knock on the door. And that's uh, what happened. Uh, he had previously uh, extended his support uh, for genomic approaches, even uh, allowed himself to be considered a lead, a, a white knight for us on this. And so I was hoping that he would stick to it. And that meeting was very clear. And then subsequent hearings of the Appropriations Committee, he made it really clear as the chair uh, that he was going to continue to be a big supporter. For people who are listening in 2023 or years afterwards, it should be noted that John Porter, Republican of Illinois, was doing this. And this was an incredibly bipartisan thing. Yes. So. Managing species. Yeah. I, uh, I know John very well. I actually babysat when I was at Northwestern. For him, <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I had it from, from another point of view. And I, I agree with you, Eric. It was a very unique individual, the kind mm -hmm. that we don't have anymore. Mm -hmm. Before we move, before we move on, I'm just curious to hear from Michael or Jane if you, sort of to get the UK view of Solera. Was it pretty much aligned with what the folks in the US were were seeing and what they're saying now, or was there a slightly different view about Solera? I think working so closely with John, the the main concern for us that came across was that the American project. Uh, funding would stop. The support, you know, if the Congress said that, you know, didn't need it, Solera um, would do the job, then we were concerned about what was, you know, we were really worried about what, what we were going to do and what was going to happen. But as Michael said earlier, the Wellcome Trust had already, um, I mean, just complete coincidence, the Blackford meeting coincided with us uh, being at the Wellcome Trust having our, you know, sort of grilling session about our increased funding. Um, and Michael and John went straight from that meeting to Cold Spring Harbour. You know, when Michael stood up the next morning, because he obviously picked up what the atmosphere was and said the Wellcome Trust will, you know, fund the whole project if, if you know, <laughs> if there's going to be a problem. I mean, I had not heard that before. I don't know whether he actually had any authorization for that, whether he made it up on the spot. But, Michael, you can comment. This really was 
an extraordinary time. I was traveling in a taxi um, to solicitors on the Friday afternoon where the news came through of the Solera thing. And that weekend was one spent running around trying to sort out what could be done. And it was fortuitous that the Wellcome Trust were had been one of their regular meetings on the Wednesday of the following week when we were looking at budgets. And with a little bit of um, pizzazz, shall we say, we ended up with getting the governors to agree that if necessary, they would fund the whole project. And they told me to go off and tell the, uh, the community at Cold Spring Harbour that's what we would do if it were necessary. The public program could not fail. That was the message. And I think it was one that righted the ship. Whether that's an exaggeration on my behalf or not, I don't know. But that's the impression I've always had. And um, I'd be interested for others to comment one way or the other. Oh, it was a huge shot in the arm, Michael. <laughs> it really did change the dynamic from feeling sort of beaten up and knocked down into, well, damn it, we're going to do this anyway, because um, Michael has said we can do it. <laughs> right. And you remember Craig's idea was, that Solera should do the human and the public can go on and do the mouse. Yes. And that <laughs> we all understood was a way to guarantee a data monopoly by saying it would be wasteful for the public to do the human also. And it was a transparent part of a business plan. Yeah. So I think we all knew there was no chance, not just that we had to, you know, it would get delivered to the public later, but there was a real risk it would never get delivered to the public. And so for, mm -hmm. for what it's worth, this, this was not an ego-driven competition. This, this was like the strongest way in which we had to defend what the purpose of public science was. And I think it pulled us together a lot, that there was no way we were going to stop this project. So I have a question for Francis then, since Francis, I just learned you spent that five-hour flight with Mike. <laughs> And um, part of the history of this is that the James Weber model with Gene Myers presentation all the way back at um, the Bermuda meeting finally got published in Genome Research. And Mike told me that, that, and James told me that Mike had read that and in discussion with Michael, uh, uh, Tony White, they oh, came up with Solera as the model, <laughs> uh, thought it would work. And then they reached out to Craig and said, would you be our front man for that. So my question really is, Francis, in your discussions with Mike, did Mike have much of an opinion or thought about all the nuances of data ownership, data release, all that stuff? But my impression was Mike was more about, he was more sort of in the spirit that we had, which is let's get this project done with the best yeah. thing way we can do it. Exactly. No, um, he did not seem to have much uh, nuance about just how critical it was going to be uh, to have the sequence public uh, in the same way that the public project had been doing. And I think Craig was probably pretty good at uh, kind of covering over the seriousness uh, of why the business model was not going to make that kind of public accessibility possible. Hunker Pillar is much more interested, yeah, in the technology and uh, yeah, I now vaguely remember him talking particularly about it being influenced by that Gene Weber paper. And it's almost like Craig was uh, like a convenient partner to get uh, Mike Hunkapiller's dream to come true. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I feel it's important for us to remember because I regard Mike as one of the heroes of the whole program for all the things he did. And, um, you know, his role in Solera, I think, is probably not the, the <laughs> Not the one we want to reflect on most warmly, but but in fact, that was where he was coming from. And of well, course, wanted... he, he did find being an arms supplier to both parties. <laughs> Let's be clear well, about that. He kind that. of was, was almost the arms builder, you know, the, the guy who designed it too. Yeah, no, he was the designer. So that's that's correct then that he sort of saw the, the Myers-Weber paper and thought that with his new capillary machines, they they would have the firepower to do it. Yep. yep. Well, well, there's another little twist in this because, of course, uh, Jim's presentation at Bermuda did not go over well, and he tried to have that manuscript published in Science. It was rejected. I visited him, coincidentally, the next month in, in uh, Wisconsin and suggested he send it to Genome Research, 
It was reviewed and thoroughly oh. bounced by Phil Green, and the editor said, we can't publish this. And I convinced everyone. I don't, Eric, I don't know if you're on board by then, were you? No, I, I was, and I actually remember that we collectively, came, or some subset of us came with this idea of making it into a point-counterpoint. Yep, so and that's the papers on, on that appear in yep. genome research, and that's what Mike saw. <laughs> so what, what's, again, for somebody 20 years later who's listening to this or, or even further in the future, what's hard to appreciate is it was really an open question at the time. There was no question that if you had a genome that was all unique sequence, you could shotgun sequence it. We knew that. You could do it in bacteria because the computer could assemble things. It was all about repeat structures in a genome. And so for a human genome with that much repeat structure, was it going to fall together right without, you know, getting all tangled up? So it was a moment that lasted several years where we really weren't sure. And we got the answer in the two papers that came out in February of 2001, when the public sequence was vastly better than the Solera only sequence. Now, of course, in retrospect, we now know how to do whole genome sequence much better by adding in libraries of different sizes and things. But it was an open question that that really drove the, the strategy of whether or not you could or couldn't do it. Eric, your, your, your view of that is completely right because I find the, even now when you talk about the Human Genome Project to young people, they think we had a playbook and they think we just followed the playbook and it was so straightforward. And of course it wasn't. Eric, Francis? Yeah, if for historians, it would be interesting for people to go back and look at a transcript of a congressional hearing in front of John Porter. I know it was June 16th of 1998 because I got married to Diane four days later and this was not my idea of a nice way to plan uh, for my wedding. And the witnesses were me, uh, Craig Venter, somebody, I can't remember who the third one, and Maynard Olson. And John Porter was really quizzing about, is this shotgun strategy going to come together for a genome as riddled with repeats as the human? And Maynard delivered this absolutely devastating takedown <laughs> of the whole approach, which turned out to be just about right. I think he predicted you know, catastrophic failure to assemble 130,000 unanchored pieces, something like that, pretty close to what happened. That was one of, and we talked about John Porter, the fact that he wanted to hear that in a public hearing and that it was very effectively uh, taken on by Maynard helped us a lot in the view of the other members of that committee who were in the room. So, you know, we've heard a lot about how Italian food was really important in the early stages of the G5, but I also know that another type of Italian food was really important as we were driving towards the draft sequence, because it has been written, for example, in Time Magazine, how pizza at Ari Petrino's townhouse was critically important for bringing together relevant parties to make sure that there was a coherent way to announce the draft sequence of both the genome project's efforts and Solera. So I've read about this in time, I've heard it anecdotally, but Ari, will you tell us a bit about your convening of Francis and Craig in your, I guess it's Rockville or is it Bethesda or North Bethesda townhouse? And, um, and, and what, what, what kind of pizza did you serve? I mean, we wanna hear it all. What can you tell us? I have to make it a short uh, presentation because we don't have a lot of time, but so mm -hmm. I'll try my best to be uh, uh, laconic. <laughs> uh, as you may know, and, and perhaps you've been too kind, all of you, not to mention it, I was aware of what Craig was planning to do for quite some time before you did. Uh, and that was the uh, the understanding I had with, with Craig, that he would share that information, but that I would not disclose. Um, it was a similar relationship with Francis, you know, at times when I would share some things with Francis that, uh, you know, I wouldn't be telling, uh, or Francis would share some things with me that I wouldn't be telling Craig. Hmm. Uh, and I felt as an out, almost as an outsider, I was not an outsider, it was quite frankly an insider as part of the DOE program, but the DOE program felt to many ways uh, as an outside program to the rest of NIHs. That was something that uh, probably a subject for another, for another story. Uh, 
Uh, so I had that unique perspective from for both programs, and I I knew both of these individuals that I had tremendous respect for and admiration. Uh, and I felt at the time, and I still feel that way, that both of them were uh, heading towards a collision that was not going to be helpful to any one of the two. Uh, so I was lobbying Francis uh, strongly for him to have this uh, uh, off-the-record meeting with Craig and see whether we could reconcile. I wasn't sure it would work, but I felt it was worth a try. Now, Francis was too committed and loyal to the rest of you that he didn't want to do anything unless, you know, he he got the okay from the rest of you. Greg didn't have that uh, qualm. I was, in fact, surprised that he was willing to do it. But I believe that around that time, he was starting to get really worried hmm. uh, that, you know, the collision may have may end up hurting him more than it would hurt us. So it was perhaps uh, appropriate for him and to his credit to see whether there was another way. And these kind of things I've done in my career because of being an outsider on many aspects. So it was worth a try and it worked out. You know, it was one Francis meeting, was, one, one meeting, one evening yeah. or multiple? No, no, it, was, it was several meetings. In fact, yeah. it was, uh, if you include the final one where we had the, the lots of brandy and so on, it was four meetings. But yeah. uh, the individuals, the three of us, were in fact three meetings. With respect to, apropos to the questions you've had earlier, uh, I have all these things uh, recorded uh, on a day-to-day -day and hour-to-hour -hour basis at times. But during this move that happened last week, all these all these records are in boxes that I haven't yet to open. So as I open them slowly, if there are any other issues that uh, yeah. that perhaps are left unanswered at the end of this conversation, I'll come back to you all and share them. So Ari tells it well. Um, let me just go back a little before that. So at the end of 1999, as it was clear we're on this collision course, uh, the public project is really rocking at that point in terms of sequence production. We had our billion base pair bash and a few other things to document that. Harold Varmus had stepped down as NIH director, I think in November, but he was willing to stay in a role of trying to broker some kind of a peace arrangement between the public project and Solera. And there was a meeting at Dulles um, with uh, Craig and a couple other people from Solera and, and uh, me where Harold tried to come up with some sort of a way that this could be a win for everybody. And uh, basically it fell apart. Uh, Craig was uh, unwilling uh, to make any kind of commitment uh, to anything other than uh, pure victory for himself. Subsequent to that, now with Ruth Kirstein as the acting director of NIH, Ruth was very worried about the way this looked. Somewhere along the way, I think Bill Clinton said uh, to his science advisor, this is bad, fix it. So Ruth suggested that we have another effort uh, to try to make peace and asked Rick Klausner uh, to convene uh, a conversation uh, with Craig and me and some other folks. Uh, that also went very poorly. And after a month or so, especially because Ruth got wind of Craig's behavior, she said, no, we're not going to do this. She was offended uh, by the way he approached it. And I think he leaked some stuff to the press. So now it's getting to be like March, maybe March. of 2000. And it's pretty clear that we are headed for what's going to be a really messy, awful circumstance in a, in a few months. And I did go to Ruth and I said, look, Ari Petrinos has been keeping in close, friendly um, relationship with both me and with Craig. Uh, what do you think about our trying to just in a very informal, quiet, secret way have a conversation to see whether something could be worked out. And she said, what the hell, go for it. And that's when we had that first meeting. And I felt bad because I did not tell you other G5 folks that that meeting was happening the first time because I thought it had, you know, 10 percent chance of making any headway, in which case, uh, why even bring it up? It was only after the second or maybe the third meeting that it seemed like, oh, something might really happen. And we all kind of got into it. That was awkward for me. I felt like this was the one time where I had not really worked with the whole team from step one to try to achieve something. And um, I guess in the long run, it probably would have been hard to do it any other way. But ultimately, Craig's willingness, because I think he saw the handwriting on the wall for a really uh, bad, messy outcome uh, to basically say, let's call it a tie, 
uh, kind of dominated his otherwise uh, strong resistance to being flexible about anything. And Ari, you helped a lot by being the sort of neutral party uh, who could kind of call him out when he was uh, acting in a way that was not going to get us uh, to yes. I don't profess to have had any great talents or capabilities. It's just being at the right place at the right time, and that worked for us. I don't know how the rest of you feel, but I think the outcome was probably an optimum among all different other options that we were facing at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Francis, was that was one of the outcomes of the those those meetings, the the arrangement that two publications would would go ahead on two products and no, no, they no, would be at the same not, time. I mean, we later. originally that had was a later conversation later. about having one joint publication, uh, and that was on, when Kennedy at the, from Science was very involved in the deliberations, but. I think the outcome still was a pretty agreeable and successful one, I feel. Yeah, publications were in a later phase. Uh, were you going to say something? Not too much later. Not much. It was July no, or maybe June. June. Yeah. yeah. The agreement then was to have a simultaneous announcement of a tie. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I okay. hope my memory, I hope. my memory for what it's worth, the Brits felt betrayed. Yes, I remember. I remember. Jane, do you want to comment? Yeah, no, I I know this this was, you know, one 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 time when John really felt that Francis had acted against the uh, against the G5 and against the spirit of collaboration. Yeah, this was the friend this was John's friendly fire. No, no, that's that was that was early. earlier. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was another topic. Well, there was another one then. <laughs> but uh, you know, back to the the late ninety nine meetings that didn't go so well. I was the G five representative at that meeting with Harold and Martin Barbaro and right. Yeah, who was so, the Tony White? Well, Tony Tony White and Gillum and uh, somebody else and and Craig were the Solera people. Eric had started a framework with with Craig earlier in November. We were we were frustrated with Eric because he was doing this on his own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but but we worked with that, and we pre we thought that Stellara had more or less agreed to these kinds of things. That we went into this meeting thinking that we were pretty close to having some kind of arrangement to, to tone down the acrimony in the press. And we got in there and it was clear from the start that Tony White had had none of this. I, I don't know. I mean, Craig was Craig was sort of in that ballpark, but it was Tony White was just not going to have uh, anything that would compromise his ability to monopolize the sequence for month, for years. That's right. Uh, and and it was clear that their business plan was to have that sequence and everything derived from it, so that they would have control of the annotation and and use of the sequence. Oh, and yeah. go ahead, Richard. Well, I was going to ask you about the timing of the fluctuations in the stock market and its its influence on the discussions <laughs> because there was a giant market upheaval, but there was also the Solera moment when, after the joint announcement of free data access, we, how did that tie into the whole dynamic there? That's a piece I've never been able to connect. I do it's... remember that the follow-up to that December meeting led to a letter from Francis to Craig and Solera, and that letter went just before Solera had its stock offering. I believe that's right, isn't it, Francis? That is right. You're remembering something I'd forgotten. And, uh, and how could you forget that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're too many things. Too many and, goals well, in the I, I, re I remember it partly because Michael's writing about this. Uh, <laughs> And anyway, it was then there was the joint announcement about no patenting and so forth. And then the Solaris stock price was going up and up and up. And then 
they had rumors that they were making a deal and right. that the, the the intellectual property was was <laughs> came into being with Blair and and Clinton's joint announcement, and then their then their stock went down. The whole market went down, right? There was thirty billion dollars in a day, or something like that, <laughs> right? Because I, because the White House press uh, secretary got the message wrong in his early morning announcement. Yes, yes. There will be no more gene patents for anything. Correct. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Congress got involved, and it was a mess. But it was clear that both sides were trying to come up with some kind of way to to moderate things uh and fortunately the one that ari brokered actually worked it was the right people in the room and so it I, is I, a, I want to move on go ahead eric one oh, last no, no, one no, then I, move well, I mean it's just the classic diplomatic solution which is both sides need a victory speech the only way you ever get to a peace treaty is each side has to have a victory speech it can give and mm -hmm. that's what this accomplished. And, you know, a tie was the only way we were going to get there. And I, I do joke that, of course, there was no data to support the genome being finished that last week of June of 2000. There was no data to support it being a tie. So it was a data free thing. And I, I think it was an announcement of the completion of the human genome to many people that allowed us to actually get on and complete the human genome. That's a perfect segue to what I wanted to ask next, which is that we have the June announcement and then you get the February 2001 publications. How did the G5 interactions change from that point until the end of the Genome Project? Because it would seem to me the whole focus changed, the Solera thing started to evaporate. Was it a whole different dynamic in the G5 interactions? Francis? Sure, it does. And, and let's not skip over uh, the intensity of what happened between June and February, uh, trying to put together uh, that landmark paper uh, in Nature. And of course, <laughs> to have an assembled genome sequence that could be appropriately annotated as best one could with a draft. And so, yes, a little tip of the hat here uh, to Jim Kent and David Hausler for the role that they played uh, to help with that. I think that was a wonderful period, actually, scientifically. That was just exhilarating uh, to be able now, instead of you know looking at the production every day, although we still were doing that, to actually figure out what's in this thing. And uh, the meeting we had in one of them in Philadelphia, um, uh, really trying to dig through that, assign who was going to do which kinds of an analyses, uh, at, uh, looking over each other's conclusions and trying to take them apart uh, to see if there was something missing there. That was a lot of fun, and we waited a long time for that. So I don't want to skip that phase, Eric, before we go on to finish the sequence. And can we also note that the papers were originally going to be in science, back yes. to back. Yes. And there was a lot of G5 debate over whether Solera was going to make their data available as scientific publication should require, mm -hmm. and a lot of unhappiness. Um, that eventually led us to nature. And I for, I recall the utterly random thing of, I was at something in New Jersey and met the physics editor of nature around the time we were talking about this. And I asked this person, do you think nature would be interested in the human genome paper? I said, I, you know, no, just curious. And the next morning, uh, a Monday morning, um, nature like was all over. We'd been already discussing could we be in science? And so I think that also changed the dynamic of publication too, because I think had they both been back-to-back -back papers in science, it might have been a little different. This got this got the journals, you know, invested in a way, and it it gave us more space because um, you know, the other party had more space. So I think it was good for the scientific community that nature and science were kind of competing by making territory for the genome because they they had a competitor in a way. You know, how things changed, we, Francis is right, we stopped talking so much about production, we still paid attention to that, but the issue became what is gonna happen with the publications. And the first was, the first issue was when it was gonna be published. And John was very much of the opinion that we should just get it out there and get on with the job 
of getting the real thing, that this was just a transitory thing and we shouldn't focus too much on it. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric was on the other hand, of course. John and Eric were <laughs> at opposite ends. As, as usual. usual. <laughs> and so I think we had initially, we were going to do a data freeze in July or something really yeah. very, you know, to, to, to sort of codify the, to justify the, the June 26th announcement that we were going to actually have a paper that would yep. prevent it from being completely data free. Uh, and, and, but we, you know, I, I think Eric was, was right that, you know, there was just a tremendous amount that we could learn from what we did have. And uh, and your driving of it was was really a, a critical thing. Jane, did you notice the change in the in the style of the calls and the focus of the calls after that? Yeah, the production was one thing, both enhancing the draft, filling in gaps that we needed to improve the assemblies, and and making that a focus of what we did. But then it was, you know, getting on to to you know think about how to how to finish it. That that's really where where my focus came in. But it, it was certainly, you know, the first the most immediate thing after the June announcement. I think was, you know, well, what have we really got here? And, and we, I, I know we all went away scurrying to, you know, sort of find out what, you know, what have we covered? What what did we need to, to do immediately to be able to get some analysis done? And as Bob said, John was pushing for a, a very quick, you know, freeze and, and publication. I think by the time there was a meeting in Paris, I think, in September. Yeah. Before that was before Philadelphia. But the Paris one, I think, was where John came right. around to, to thinking, yeah, no, we, we can do more analysis on this. I have a question for you, actually. I mean, prior to that, the Sanger's first, triumph, I suppose, in the human genome was, was to get chromosome 22, um, you know, the finished sequence written up and, and published in December 99. Mm -hmm. How much did doing that influence uh, both the push on to get the finished sequence, but also the types of analysis that, that you know, you felt, Eric, especially, you know, needed to be done for the, for the finished, for the uh, the draft paper. I think it was very influential because like a lot of our issues were we didn't know what the genome looked like mm -hmm. and trying to assemble and analyzing a genome from fragmentary information without a glimpse of better information was hard. And so I think it, it sort of raised, you know, raised up the categories of things that we should do. And then we asked, how much could we do with a draft in that nodding in that direction. So this is again, another example of where these diverse points of view and diverse, you know, activities, I think informed each other. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I think the hands down lesson is that as unwieldy as, as some of these consortia can seem, they are so much more powerful because of the intellectual diversity. Mm -hmm. So, so I can speak to that too, if I may. That I think the chromosome 22 paper was beautiful and influential. It set a standard for what a chromosome-specific finished paper should be. But in terms of the motivation, I feel like we were all on this autopilot this phase. We were going to get a finished or essentially complete product done. And so the commitment was there. It was more influential in the sense of how it was presented and what the, what the published product would look like. I have a self-serving question. How much was the Bermuda meetings an influence on following through with the G5 and the G15 meetings? How mm. influential was Bermuda or not? You're shaking your head, Eric. Mm. I, I never found the Bermuda meetings to be intellectual driving forces. Just saying that I found there were many meetings that were critical, but I thought Bermuda was important for inclusivity and all that, but they I, they didn't seem to me the intellectual drivers of mm -hmm. a lot of these decisions. They were important to have, but I think they were important for other reasons. 
Well, most important of all, of course, uh, the decision uh, to do immediate public data release. Uh, when everybody hears Bermuda, that's what they think, and they should. That decision was critical, but my recollection is not everybody even agreed to it. The Japanese had issues with this. Yeah, they weren't authorized to uh, actually right. make a decision. So it, yeah, but getting that idea out there is, I think, the critical thing from Bermuda. When did the the the, the April twenty fifth deadline come into place? Because we're all saying, "Oh, it was you know we're all going to get it done," but yeah. we did set ourselves another utterly artificial deadline that forced us again. And I don't remember. No, it was the publication of the. That it that was, was not France. arbitrary. It was, it was not France. arbitrary. Yes. No, no, of course it's not arbitrary. It was poetic. It's poetic. It was, because, it was to commemorate the Watson and Crick paper. Of right. course, but we didn't have to tie ourselves to the mass to get to that date. You could have picked another oh, no. date. France, France, and it was France. France, did okay. that. France yeah, I'm did afraid, that. yeah. And, and I'm worked. sure he did it so that he would have he could drive us harder. Yeah. <laughs> did I think it helped. You think it helped with me? What? <laughs> Okay, we're getting near the end, but I want to, before I sort of ask the final question, I want each of you to, to think about, is there a memory of the G5 experience, either a call or a feeling or, or, or a story or something that, that we haven't said? I mean, I want this to be very brief, but is, is it sort of in a word or a phrase or, you know, a sentence, is there something about your G5 experience that you have as a, as a key memory but you haven't said it yet during our conversation today. Is there anything that comes to mind about the experience, Bob? I, I don't know that this is about the G5 calls for, for as much, but we haven't talked about the map. And I have to talk about the map because that's what we, we put a lot of effort into the map. And, and it really was what drove the golden path to a successful outcome. Uh, it supplied the clones to us and Eric and others. And I don't know, we, I think Marco and I calculated he did 63 liters of agarose gels to <laughs> in the course of a year. <laughs> the, the map, the fingerprint, more than 350,000 clones. Ladina worked tirelessly with Jim Kent to feed him. You know, we could essentially fingerprint the sequence clones and and put those on the map and and that was key for Jim Kent to be able to assemble things and and it was also what Solera used to put their uh, sequence together. <laughs> Otherwise, Richard, they had one hundred they had one hundred nineteen thousand random pieces and they they put them on chromosomes through uh, the STS maps and the fingerprint maps. Yep. Richard, what's what's your memory that we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah, so I'll we'll, we'll be closing out because we're getting to time, right? Um, just a general comment first. This has been a great discussion about all the exciting stuff that happened up before 2000, but so much stuff happened between then and 2003, which is our yep. actual anniversary. I wish we had another two hours to talk <laughs> that through. But the thread that will come through that is about the map and the clone availability through from that period in, in 99 when we changed tactics through to where we arrived at our finished model, you know, our finished pieces and how we pull those pieces together and kind of what happened in between. I suspect that's part of the uh, the ingredients for Francis having to call people and say, tone it down on the G5 call, because <laughs> that was a pretty contentious set of issues. And, uh, but anyway, we're celebrating today um, this completion. The thing I remember, and I can't even say when that moment was, there was a particular moment in the whole <clears throat> And when we stopped kind of looking up and saying, what should we do generally? And all looked at each other and said, what would it take to get the whole job done? And so this idea of completion as the starting thought for building the model, which to me, that's a product of the Genome Project. Mm -hmm. But I don't exactly remember when it was. It was somewhere in 99 or 98. Jane, what's your memory? One, well, one thing we haven't mentioned, you know, is the the work that went on to do to get the databases and the annotation pipelines working this was another diverse activity at, at sanger but mm -hmm. you know when we came to put that sequence together yeah jim kent and uh, put up a, a web browser 
for you in the US especially, but the ensemble pipeline was ready to go. Um, mm -hmm. It had already put some some data up and it, it was re it was ready and there was an annotation pipeline that you know could work and and that could give us the first view of the the, the contents etc. And I think yeah. the work that went in that is is worth remembering. But I think one other very quick memory that I've got I can remember I think it was the Paris meeting when um, I met Rick Wilson one morning and he just came up and gave me a big hug. And then he said to the others, he said, you know, being able to hug other people, okay, I was the only, you know, I'm, well, I'm the only woman on this call. I was often the only woman in the room, both in the Sanger and, um, you know, sort of at, at other meetings that we had. But he said, you know, having, having a mix and having a different view, having different perspective is important. Eric, your memory? So my my G five memory I'm going to say is is actually a G sixteen memory. It was Francis the National Building Museum. Oh we yes, had, we had the party celebrating <laughs> the paper, the publication in February. I think it was of of the draft sequence paper. And th what sticks most in my mind is that the G five conversations were also internal and so intense. But coming over to the National Building Museum that day, Lori and I took a cab and the cabbie asked where we were going. And I said, we're going to this big celebration of the sequencing of the human genome and this paper. And the cabbie, you know, turns around and he's, oh, the human genome project. <laughs> are you the guys who are giving away the information for free? <laughs> and <laughs> and it was the moment that I realized, oh my God, there are like people all over the world, cabbies in DC, who <laughs> are on top of this, followed it. And despite all the turbulence and noise, they got the point. And I I will never forget that cabbie. I should have gotten his name. <laughs> Francis. That's a great story, Eric. Uh, my mom came to that uh, particular party uh, a year before she died, and I'm cherishing those pictures of what happened. And we had a band, and the band sang some silly genome songs that were written for the occasion. So, yeah, it seemed an appropriate moment to get outside of our very focused, work-oriented effort and just kick up our heels a little bit. But my memory that I was going to mention is it was at Early House, and I'm not sure when this one happened, but it was during the clear threat of whether the public project was going to be eclipsed by Solera. And I remember Bob and John were sitting in a couple of lounge chairs somewhere out there in the Early campus and uh, sort of holding court and, and I walked by and we got in this conversation where, Bob, you and John basically said, look, Francis, you're going to have to really stiffen your backbone. You're going to have to be ready in the court of public opinion and the media to be able to be the best you've ever been in order to explain why the public project is still relevant and why it matters because of the data access. So don't go soft on us. Do you remember that? I was like, OK, I got the message. <laughs> I do. it, And I mean. We talked, you know, Solera had this uh, incredible PR machine. Oh, yeah. And and we had the government. <laughs> <laughs> Upset, yeah. Um, I, I want to hear from Ari and then Michael. Well, for me, the, the most important memory is uh, the memory of my good friend and colleague, Mar Frazier, who was on my oh. side during all the mm -hmm. deliberations. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, as you may remember, was going through some very serious health problems at the time, but nevertheless, he persevered. Uh, he was in the office on a lot of the G5 calls, even though he was you know, one step away from death. Mm -hmm. uh, and I owed him uh, almost all the success, if I had any success, uh, because he was the power and the force behind the DOE Human Genome Project. Mm -hmm. Michael? My memory obviously has to do with the famous meeting where the Wellcome Trust announced that they were going to fund the human genome irrespective of anybody else. And in particular, arriving at Cold Spring Harbour uh, after a long flight from London and going into the bar. And as I said it in somewhere else, 
People were running around like chickens that had their cho heads chopped off. Everybody was in a total state of dismay. No, in everybody thought the end had come. And I was the second coming, I guess. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> right. Right. So um, I think I've covered everybody on the memories, correct? Yes. So last question, and I know we're coming up against time. So I want you to answer this question either in a word or a phrase, maybe a sentence. So we're now 20 years past to the end of the Human Genome Project. We've discussed extensively how the G5 played a, a central role in getting the Genome Project across the finish line. I want you to think back on the day the Human Genome Project ended, April 25th, 2003, and think about the last 20 years. What singularly, what singularly has surprised you the most about genomics over the last 20 years? Richard, can we start with you? I know it's a hard question. Yeah, it's a tough question. Um, uh, you know, I think the gap between what we know is logical and can be driven by the use of genomics and genetics to understand biology and life and how it's getting implemented and rolled out to the front line. You know, we hoped, some of us hoped back then, that the whole world would be genetically literate, enamored of DNA, wake up every morning thinking about that as a part of their lives, and uh, it's taken a while to get there. Jane, what do you uh, what surprise I, you the most? How how much it's already being applied in medicine? Bob, that's a gap. <laughs> Bob. I, I would say how pervasive genomics has become. You know, we thought about it as the Human Genome Project, and, and obviously I thought about it from the worm standpoint and model organisms, but it's just everywhere, in every field. Uh, it's, it's driving biology. And I just, I, I've been amazed at how pervasive it is. Ari, what do you think? Well, you know, as... Uh... As somebody who had to compete almost violently with high energy physics and the rest of the physical sciences community, it is just so wonderful to see them shoved aside by what the Human Genome Project did to biology. It's something I rejoice and celebrate almost every day and look forward to further siding, sidestepping these uh, other programs because we have so much more we can produce, you know, as I like to say, we can almost stoop down and get the uh, the gold nuggets that are on the surface, whereas they have to dig deep, very deep, and spend way more money than we can to produce the, the these type of results. Michael? A couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I went to a meeting for the first time in many years in London. Uh, genomics it must there must have been two three thousand people there the place was stuffed to the gills with new instrumentation new technology it was quite staggeringly amazing to me genomics is now everywhere eric the stunning thing to me is just how the progress has been so much faster and so much further than i ever could have imagined on April 25th, 2003. We talked then about, oh, it would be great to have a reference sequence of the human genome. And what's unfolded since, the catalogs of all the genes, all the variants, <laughs> all the RNA expressions, all the cell types, you know, the ability to edit that, the ability in the coming years to find all the programs. I think this concept of a reference and the power of foundations in biology have totally changed what biology was about from the days when everybody was wandering around finding their gene or doing their thing to, to making it a, a broadly understandable domain. So I don't think people are going to be able to go back. I mean, my students still ask, how did you do anything before the Human Genome Project? Because they can't conceive of that anymore. So 
That's what surprised me. I thought there'd be good things, but I had no idea they'd be this good. Uh, and appropriately so, Francis, I'm going to give you the last word. Well, so many good words have already been spoken. One thing we have to mention, of course, is just the amazing advance in the technology uh, that that first genome uh, that we celebrated on April 25th, 2003, cost us somewhere in the neighborhood of $400 million. And I know of no other technology that has come down in cost and gone up in quality um, and, and gone up in speed. You, you usually can't get faster, better, and cheaper. We got all of those in a remarkably effective way, thanks to all the investments that were made as part of the Genome Project, and that's encouraged uh, the technology to keep going. And I also, even taking Richard's concern, which I share, that this should have gone faster in terms of the medical applications, I do celebrate where we are 20 years later. Let's particularly say with cancer, a lot of lives have been saved as a result of our ability to sequence a cancer. A lot of newborns have had their diagnosis made clear right away instead of going uh, through many years uh, of a diagnostic journey uh, odyssey that led nowhere. And let's not forget infectious disease. If we didn't have genomics now spread across the world, including in South Africa and Nigeria, we would have seen a whole lot worse things happen with Ebola and then with COVID-19. Genomics has spread into that space also in an incredibly powerful way. We should not rest, however, to try to be sure that that trajectory goes forward and we shorten the time that Richard points out, which is still way too long between when we know something will help people and we actually get it done. Eric, when you make this video, you should calculate how many human genome sequences were sequenced, how many human genomes were sequenced during this call. <laughs> Just report that to people. <laughs> okay. And that's another measure of what these 20 years are about. Yes. No, I mean, I was thinking the same thing, Eric, that, you know, we spent how many years and how many dollars and how many people doing this and, and you can actually get a whole genome, not 95% of it or whatever we have, <laughs> uh, and, and get the whole thing, telomere to telomere, uh, and they're doing it thousands. Yeah. yeah. There you go. This is fun. Well, we are at the end. I want to do nothing short of profoundly thanking all of you for joining today and sharing your memories and your ideas and um, filling in a lot of bits and pieces that we didn't have already about the G5. I will just tell you, as I said earlier, I wasn't a member of the G5, but I was a great admirer and a fan. And um, in the last 20 years, I've only come to admire each and every one of you even more so. Um, and I'm not at all surprised we had a wonderful conversation. In fact, I enjoyed this conversation so much, I've made the command decision. We're gonna do this again in 10 years for the 30th anniversary. So please be on the lookout for an email from me in about nine and a half years to get it on your calendars because we'll wanna reconvene and see what our memories are like 10 years from now. Totally different by then. Totally different, and we will compare. And that's the fun part of all of this. So with that, I will say, we're done. Okay, now we can, we're, we're still recording, but now we can be more informal. So thank you all. This was fantastic, better than I possibly could have dreamed of. I hope you enjoyed it. And I know we just went a few minutes over. Any last comments anybody want to make? It was fun. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. It was fun seeing you all again. Ah.